everyone, and welcome to this spoiler review for episodes one through five of The Crown. I'm the outlaw, John Roca, joined on these reviews like I was for season four, if you all remember way back when. The great Laura Kelly. How are you, Laura? I'm doing amazing. I'm so excited to be back in this very lush, rich world of The Crown. <laughs> it's just, it's nice to sort of escape what we're having right now in our yeah. real world. This like global recession. They're going through a global recession. Oh, we're kind of all in the same boat. So it yeah. works out. We're all involved in everybody's love lives who are famous and are political or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of things that are still echoing today, even though we're going all the way back to 1992 with season five. And we've done the recasting. This is almost like Doctor Who. We've regenerated the whole cast or House of the Dragon doing the time jumps here. We've got Imelda Staunton coming in as Queen Elizabeth, Jonathan Price as Prince Philip, Dominic West as Prince Charles, Elizabeth Debecki coming in, taking Emma Corrin's place here as Princess Diana. Natasha McElhone is a new addition to the cast here as Penny Notchbull. And then Leslie Manville is coming in as Princess Margaret. But we do get uh, occasional uh, appearances by Claire Foy and by Vanessa Kirby here in the first five episodes, which was fun to see as well. And certainly if you know the story of the Royals and Diana around this time, people like Andrew Morton, they are in the, they're in the, um, in the purview here. Uh, Prime Minister John Major, which is being played by uh, Johnny Lee Miller. Yes, sick boy from Train Spotting has grown up enough to play not only Sherlock Holmes, but also now John Major in uh, in the British world here of the Crown. So uh, I, I, we're going to break everything down. We're going to talk overall storylines. We're not going to go episode prep, so we're going to talk about overall storylines because it's pretty cohesive. First five episodes here dealing with some of these main storylines that are running through this series. But let's just talk about overall. How are you feeling about the new cast? How are you feeling about how the story is being told over these next over these first five episodes here of season five of The Crown War? I mean, I absolutely love this new cast, and I don't know mm. why I'm surprised. I'm eternally surprised when they turn the cast over, and I'm just like, there's no way it's going to be as good yeah. as it was. I mean, how do you top Olivia Coleman? Like, really? But they do it. They do. I mean, it's yeah. just as good as it has been, and I'm very, very pleased. Um, I loved Claire Foy. I love Olivia Coleman's interpretation, but... Imelda Staunton, there's this, like, she's so relaxed in yeah, this yeah. role. And, you know, like, Olivia Coleman sort of came to this role with, like, this sort of restlessness, like, almost an agitation and, like, a stiffness mm -hmm. that was, like, really perfect for the time period and it really worked for the role. And in this, where, where Queen Elizabeth II is in, in her life now, we've got Staunton bringing this sort of, like, steadfast calm that is so wonderfully balanced. And she's really making the role her own, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, I think with Prince Philip, I am, was so excited to hear that Jonathan Price was going to be playing Prince Philip. I yeah. was very surprised to see like, I mean, we had this sort of very much darker versions of Prince Philip in mm -hmm. prior seasons. I mean, Matt Smith brings the sort of mischievousness to it. And then yeah. um, Tobias Menzies brought this very like sort of dark malice almost to it. Yeah. And I just it's hard for me to almost sort of picture this I don't the sort of gentleness of Jonathan Price bringing anything like that to this role, but we do see whispers of it still. Yeah, especially when he's having conversations with Diana. Yeah. Um, Leslie Manville is compl is commanding every scene that she's in. She just steals it away from whoever else is in the scene with her. Love Dominic West as Prince Charles, although he is way too good looking and way too hot to be playing Prince Charles. Hundred <laughs> percent um, agree. Hundred percent agree. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, Elizabeth Debicki as Princess Diana. I really didn't think I was going to like this interpretation. I was like, I was, uh, I thought that was, I was sort of surprised when that piece of cast news came through but she really has the like diana voice down number one yeah. perfectly and I, whoever's doing like the dialect and voice coaching on the show like that alone should win an emmy for that person yeah. um because she's she's got that sort of like diana's smile that kind of bashfulness that sort of pouty look that she's um she's got all of that down perfectly so yeah. i'm really really enjoying this new cast i'm so happy with it i can't wait to see episodes six through ten because right now we've only watched the mm -hmm. one through five i'm mm -hmm. excited to see where it goes what are you thinking of all of this new cast yeah i'm loving it yeah i'm with you i didn't think imelda staunton was going to work because i mean i know her from the harry potter films and other Same. films that she's done in the past and i was like she's a much more abrasive and uh, shrill and uh, aggressive actress and in a majority of things that I've seen her and I know Vera Drake she wasn't quite like that but in other things most other things I've seen her and she's a bit more like that so to see this you're so right here Laura this more restrained calmer 
approach to things. And it makes sense, right? Claire Foy is coming into being the queen like she's coming into the role. So there's a little more of the wide-eyed looking around, trying to figure out where she fits, trying to figure out how to come to terms with Phillips's dalliances and his flirting and all of this, and also uh, symbolize what she's supposed to symbolize for the people because she clearly took it very seriously. Olivia Coleman is much more of a, uh, you know, she's still somewhat in her 40s and 50s, still young, still somewhat in command of herself. So she's much more, um, how can I say this, frisky, much more pushy, much more stronger about her opinions. But what we're seeing in the first five episodes here is this is a queen that is having to come to terms with what being the queen has done to her family, the damage she has done. And, you know, I can speak this from my own experience. When you get older, all of a sudden that piss and vinegar from your younger days, from your 30s or 40s, it starts to dissipate. And as you glimpse the end of your life, you start to see things differently or appreciate them differently. And the love you have for people, especially the people who have been with you through all the wars, it deepens even more so that they're still around, that they're still your people. So I, I see that, like, and, and you, you speak so well about Leslie Manville. Her scene with Elizabeth, when they go at it about Peter Townsend, and then later when she calls her and Margaret's like, it's not your fault, I don't blame you. But, but, but Elizabeth still feels the blame because she loves her sister so much. It's great to see that they finally, after all the wars of the different casts, they're actually coming together as sisters finally this late in life. It's so nice to see, even with the understanding of all the things that have happened. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, Dominic West does a great job as Charles because you can tell the frustration that is coming through of Charles wanting to have more of a say in things, wanting to push forward, wanting to create this more modern democracy, uh, monarchy. rather. And I think he does an excellent job with that. But yes, he's much too good looking, much too good for Charles. I agree 100%. <laughs> Even uh, my girlfriend saw me watching the episode. She's like, yeah, no, he's way too hot to be playing. Because she's a big fan of The Wire. Yeah. She's like, way too hot to be playing. Charles, you're right. But um, Elizabeth Debicki is the discovery here. Because you know, I saw her in Tenet. I saw her in Man from Uncle. And I saw her in Guardians of the Galaxy uh, Volume 2. So I, I haven't seen her act, act, right? And this allows her to really embody Diana from hiding behind the curtain to the stilted higher pitched thing she does with her voice, the delivery, the speech patterns, the way she looks at things. Like Emma Corrin did a fantastic job laying the groundwork for Diana. And Elizabeth, sure. Elizabeth De DeBecky has like taken the tour, uh, taken the baton and run even further with it. And it's been fascinating to watch here in this, in these first five episodes. And I also think the themes of these first five episodes have been really nice to explore this idea of like, okay, she's feeling, Elizabeth is feeling like she might be a little too, she might be past it. Like she might be out of touch with the, her public. Charles, as I said, wanting the peace of the monarchy. Um, we're seeing the relationships falling apart for all her children. We're seeing the introduction of Mohammed Fayed, which will lead to Dodi Fayed, which will lead to the relationship with Diana, which of course, who is in the car with Diana, but Dodi when she dies. So there's all these seeds being laid and they're taking their time to flesh all this stuff out that I think has been fascinating over these first five episodes. I do have a couple of criticisms, which we'll get to later, but let's break down some of these storylines, Laura, as we, as we look at these first five episodes, as I mentioned here, we get from the beginning, that first episode, when she, when we see, when we go back in time and see Claire Foy christening the yacht Britannia or the ship Britannia there. And, um, we see her and when we go forward in time, we see her dealing with that physical, but also we see this conversations with her and Philip because Philip senses that there's something wrong with the ship. Elizabeth doesn't want to hear it, doesn't want to recognize that Philip is hearing something wrong with the ship. And she keeps saying how the ship is um, can still do its thing. It's, you know, it's been around a long time. So the symbolism there that it's her as the ship. You know, but Philip is the one that's sensing maybe it's time to turn it over. So it seems that's what's running through these first five episodes from the Queen Victoria syndrome and all of that is this idea that she may be past it, maybe out of touch, that she is old news and no longer popular with her own uh, constituency anymore or her people anymore. So there's this agitation from her side to want to be relevant, to want to matter. Um, and it's a bit of a surprise here that she's sensing that. The people, have, it feels like they've all of a sudden turned on her. So how do you think they're handling that storyline over the first five episodes? And what's standing out for you as you see them uh, exploring this? 
Well, I think that Queen Victoria syndrome in particular is obviously explored much more deeply, I think, in episode one. I think yes. that episode, if I recall, is literally called that. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I really like how they handle the story because, you know, we start these opening scenes with Imelda Staunton in the role and yeah. she's getting like a physical from a doctor and she learns that she's gained weight. She's having problems with <laughs> her feet. I mean, yeah. we the the symbolism with, in relation to the Britannia is so... It's very much in your face with this first episode, but right. it, I think it works. I think it works really, really well. Um, the fact that she's, you know, they're sort of hiding all of these polls that have come out yes, that are being published the in the Times. paper. Yeah, yeah saying yeah. that she's like sort of lost touch and, you know, she's kind of trying to sweep some of these issues with the Britannia under the rug, or at least she has for the last couple of years. Now they've gotten to a point where they really can't anymore. The, the ship has fallen into such bad disrepair. Yeah. Um, but the, I think one of the more interesting pieces of this first episode, especially with relation to kind of where she's at in her health and where the ship is at, is I mean, she talks about how she asks for very little in exchange for her service to the country in, in hopes that, you know, if something were, like this were to come up, that she can ask for help yeah. and ask for her wishes to be fulfilled in this thing, which... I mean, just in itself feels very out of touch. I mean, mm. you're saying you're asking for very little. How many homes and how many, how much privilege do you yeah. have? I know you didn't ask for it, but like just that alone, I think is, it, it's just, it shows very much how this sort of feeling of the crown being out of touch really seems to be true. And I like how mm. they, they wove that story with the Britannia in and out of this first episode in particular. How did you interpret all of that? Yeah, I loved it. I mean, I think it was correct. Cause I mean, having seen the queen, which, um, uh, uh, which was with Helen Mirren. And of course she won the Oscar for that. And Peter Morgan wrote that as well. So seeing him revisit this kind of thing again in a different way with much more time to flesh it out. Elizabeth's situation with her people, Diana's effect on their family. All of that has been fun to see here, but certainly Elizabeth, as you mentioned here in that first episode, we see her christening Britannia and then we see the issues with Britannia, but also what it extends out to, right? Her issues with trying to figure out all the different things that are going wrong on her battleship, which is her monarchy, all the different things that are falling apart, that aren't really working, that are, that are feeling like they want to dock this ship forever and exchange it for something newer and younger, that that kind of feeling that uh, pervades throughout, the, or permeates rather throughout the first five episodes is so great. And we see her dealing with it. You know, Amelda Staunton doing such fantastic work in the quiet moments, right? The conversation with Philip, about marriages, about what marriage should be and shouldn't be. You see, she's still holding on to that Claire Foy stuff from the first season where she had a very clear thing that she loved. Philip would never cheat on Philip, but Philip is always going to allude to this idea of wanting other things. Once again, this these cracks in the, in the hull of the ship, in essence, of her monarchy, we see that permeating throughout. And then the fire happens, which is another symbolism of 120 rooms being burnt, part of her monarchy going down possibly. All this, keeping the precious stuff, but losing all these 120 rooms. Is that a symbol? Is that something that she, be, she should be doing? And the amazing about face where she delivers that speech, a contrary to her mother's um, advice, she delivers this speech in Anas Horribilis that, um, uh, episode where she talks about how 1992 has been a very difficult year because of all that's happened with her kids and all that's happened with the monarchy and all of this. And she's willing to say like, we should not be beyond reproach are as well. So it's, it's a fascinating character because there's a lot of contradictions, as you said really well, her privilege is there for everybody to see. And even some, a little bit of her racism when she won't sit next to Muhammad Fayyad yeah. at, uh, at the horse races there or at the polo grounds, um, you see that coming through as well. So you as a viewer have to kind of navigate that in your mind about how you take her in as a whole. And I kind of love that the show doesn't shy away from that. Because I mean, Mohammed was a little racist too until he found out that that gentleman had served King Edward and could help him or the deposed King or the Edward who had abdicated, it, he served him. And so he could have, so how real was that relationship? So there was a lot here that was explored on Elizabeth that I thought was really interesting and her finally coming to terms with the fact that she has to accept that Anne is going to get divorced and find a new man, that uh, Margaret is mad at her for Peter Townsend, that Charles and Diana finally come to her for the divorce, and that even Andrew gets a moment, uh, which they've really kind of dropped the ball, in my opinion, over as a series, 
with Andrew and Sarah breaking up. We didn't even know that they were, you know, they were just kind of together in the background. They didn't even address that at all. So you've got that running through here. So I like the way they've given much more nuance and new ways to kind of interpret this character of Elizabeth for sure. Is there anything more you want to add to how they've kind of handled her in the first five episodes here? No, I think that's probably okay. about it. I would be, I, I did want to mention when you brought up her speech that oh, yeah. this, you know, this whole scene of her mother being so against yeah. what she was about to go do, which is essentially apologize to the, the Commonwealth. And the fact that Philip in that moment really steps up and he's like, yeah. what is it like? It's for her pre peace of mind. That's what's important here. And the fact yeah. that he stands up for her in that way, we see those glimpses of Philip along the way where he really steps up in, in the husband department. But that was one of my favorite moments, I think, for him. I enjoyed that. I agree with you. And that's that's the thing that's so great about this show is that these are human characters with all the intricacies and the hypocrisies at times within human beings. And so when we were watching that, we have to kind of watch this show with much more of an understanding and grace with these characters than we normally might with another show. And I think that's so great. Uh, about the writing and the layering that they do with these rich characters. Uh, let's move on to Charles, who is also an element of the Elizabeth storyline here, because Charles, he has this passive aggressive desire to be king. Um, he, he, him, The stuff with him and Camilla Parker Bowles, who Olivia Williams, who some of you may know from Rushmore and other projects, doing a fantastic job as Camilla taken over for Emerald Fennel from last season. Um, and he is like laying the groundwork and needling and being passive aggressive and working behind the scenes from episode one here to in essence force his mother to step down because he feels frustrated by the situation that he's in he wants to do more he wants to be known for more he wants to achieve things he doesn't want to be just sitting there waiting for his mother to die so he can finally be king which is of course ironic that it finally happened this year just a few months ago so what an interesting um approach they've taken to charles here in these first five episodes you do sense that there's an honesty with him certainly the prince's trust there it speaks highly of him and his instincts to help other people to help people of all faiths as we see in that uh, tv interview he does and helping the young children which that episode uh Put, has the uh, words at the end on the screen telling you how many people have been helped by that Prince's Trust charity. But then again, on the other side, he's he's being a bit manipulative, being, the, being behind the articles against Diana, being writing a book probably about Diana, which motivates her to write her book, but then also uh, supporting that poll behind the scenes to kind of force Elizabeth, his own mother, to possibly look at abdicating or stepping down rather than having Charles take over. What do you think about how... The, that all went through the first five episodes uh, and how West portrayed that throughout. Everything that happened with Prince Charles in this se in this first half of this season was very, I think, enlightening for me. I feel like <laughs> I just didn't know. I didn't really know what to expect. And I don't, yeah. I, when I think of who is now King Charles III, I'm like, I don't think modern and progressive. So right. this was like, how this funny. was very educational actually to go back <laughs> and see, you know, what, how really, what was he actually like in this time in his life? Because what I know and what I sort of know of history from that time, having been very young when we lived through it yeah. is not, it's mostly very negative of Charles. So yeah. Yeah. True. This, it was certainly enlightening. Um, one scene in particular that really struck me was this this first scene that we sort of that we get with Charles and Prime Minister John Major. Oh, yeah. Where it's just an incredibly well written scene because we all know what Charles's drive is yeah. in that scene. We, John Major, knows what he's going for, mm -hmm. and nobody can say it out loud. And so he just talks around it the entire time. And it's yeah. such a weird conversation, but it works. And it's such a great scene. And I think it just, it's such a, a commendable thing for the writing and this show that scene in particular, I really enjoyed in, in the first episode, but a lot of this stuff with Charles is uh, really interesting. I think early on, because I think somebody says to his face at one point, you know, there's this, you know, positivity and there's this great mm. drive in the public of wanting you to step up and do more. But a lot of that is due to Diana. Like they just yes. say it to his face. Right. No one's beating around the bush in that. <laughs> They're all very direct, these Brits in this show. Yeah. Um, and he doesn't seem to be surprised or bothered by that. 
Um, But I think in particular with Dominic West, what he brings to this role in this phase of Charles's life is this great confidence. When we left Josh O'Connor in the last season, I mean, we got a, we had a very vulnerable Charles with um, when it came to how Josh O'Connor played him. And this is a much more sure, steadfast, confident man sort of in his prime so i really enjoy the different inter- it's a very different interpretation than previous seasons but mm. it should be it makes a lot of sense i think for where he is in his life and especially when we get to this scandal oh, yeah. <laughs> that i i mean again like i, I was young when all this happened in real life oh, I, so you I don't had no know me- about this oh, i had no really? idea about oh, yeah. any of this and when i had to look it up i was it was very enlightening. I mean, mm. the fact that they did that conversation pretty much verbatim yeah. and they're still not totally sure how that tape ended up in the hands of mm-hmm. a publication. I mean, it was interesting. Like I said, enlightening <laughs> is kind of the best word for me to describe everything that happened with Charles in this season for me. How was that different for you? Yeah, I I didn't know how they got a hold of that. So the way they're portrayed in the show, that was to use your word, enlightening for me, for sure. I didn't know that. I knew about the record because, you know, we talked about it when we did our season four reviews. I'm a massive um, uh, fan of the monarchy, not fan in terms of support, but fan in terms of reading everything about the monarchy and certainly the Charles and Diana thing, because I have had such a love for Diana. Um, I was very into knowing all of that and reading everything I could about that. And the tapes, when I found out about the tapes and listened to the tapes, that's, that was really annoying because there's two ways to look at it. I think that's another element of the portrayal of Charles in this um, first five episodes that you bring up really well, Laura, because Anne even says it when she goes to visit him after the scandal and he's sick in bed, he's defiant. And she says, this is not the Charles that we've seen before. He's stronger. He's much more able to handle things. He's a different Charles. So in a way, the first five episodes of this show kind of redeem him a little bit, even though he's totally cheating on Diana, and even though that's so awkward that Camilla Parker Bowles' husband seems to be okay with it or has come to terms with it when she takes the call in the other room, like he's totally aware of what's happening, but it's very strange. But then we see how he kind of comes through these scandals, kind of survives these scandals. That's what was enlightening for me as well, seeing this stronger Charles. I didn't know that there was a stronger Charles that came out of it and how he handled things and how he... Um, stayed strong in both his belief um, in what he could be as a king, his desire to want to do more, which ends up yielding the prince's trust, and also his defiance in his love for Camilla. Like, it is there. And so that conversation, when you're looking at it on the outside, we do see Elizabeth DeBecky as Diana, like, reading the paper uh, and and consuming that, which was really hard for her, from what Diana said. Um But we also know that those are conversations that you have with people that you love or you care about. And yeah, does it get scatological like that? Well, maybe not. Depends on who you are as a person. But those are intimate conversations that you have with somebody and they're playful and they're they're sweet and innocent within the person that you're because she was obviously receptive to it and played and had her own jokes about it. And so this was a two people who love each other having in essence like a teenage conversation at their ages. And I think that's where, when he's getting brought before Philip and that whole tribunal, there sitting at the table. um, You see him almost like a child with his head bowed, you know, taking the very ashamed, right. Very ashamed. (laughs) Yes. Because they're like, Oh, it's unbecoming a man in his forties having this kind of a conversation or or his thirties, maybe late thirties, but like that kind of thing. So you, you almost feel for Charles a little bit, which is something I did not expect to feel as I was watching these first five episodes, I was ready to hate him, right? But oh, yeah. seeing a little bit more of this, it's not that it excuses anything. It's just more you start to see, once again, there's human characters, there's a lot of foibles, but also a lot of instincts to do good. And certainly Charles does have that instinct within him, even though he can be at times impetuous, uh, uh, condescending or conceited or frustrating or what have you. He, I think um, Dominic Des- West did a fantastic job of bringing that out in Charles over these first five episodes, along with the writing and the direction, of course, um, as well. Um, all right, let's move on to Diana here, um, uh, Laura, with Elizabeth DeBecky's performance. Um, we see that she starts out, you know, having the uh, initially wanting to still be in the relationship, wanting to still dive into this second honeymoon with Charles in that first episode. And then they get into that fight because Charles wants to go back, as you mentioned, and talk to Prime Minister Major because of that poll. Now he kind of lies to her that he has the speech he has to do. 
Um, and we see the separation of them grow bigger and bigger over the first five episodes. We see her book uh, come out. We see her uh, talk to Peter Morton through um, a, um, what do you call it? Through another person, through her, uh, I guess her home secretary there. Uh, we see uh, what she goes through with the kids and her love for the children. Uh, and then we see her talking, uh, becoming friends with Mohammed Fayed, which I think was a really sweet scene between those two. Uh, and then uh, at the end there, we see her sitting in front of Elizabeth, agreeing with Charles about getting the separation, the legal separation. Um, and we see the damage to a degree of what that book does. And before it comes out, uh, Philip confronts her and has the back and forth with her, which is really interesting and had shades of what we saw at the end of the last season when Emma Corrin and uh, Tobias Menzies have that uh, back and forth at Balmoral. So um, what are your thoughts on how they handled Diana throughout the first five episodes and how Elizabeth DeBecky portrayed her in these moments? Uh, what stood out to you? The, her portrayal is so utterly charming and in a way that I imagine is spot on in terms of what it, what it seems, you know, just given how much the general public, how much love they had for Diana. So I think DeBecky's performance is really, really well done. It still brings in that vulnerability, but it's mm. almost not as much vulnerability as Emma Corrin brought to the role. She's a little bit older, a little bit wiser a little bit more yeah. established and comfortable e even still being uncomfortable but she's more comfortable in her role <laughs> and where she's at um one of the first things that she does early in the season in in this season is sort of stand up to charles when yeah. they're on their yeah. second honeymoon they're on the boat and she wants to go shopping and she wants to do water sports with the kids and he doesn't he just wants to go to museums <laughs> and nobody else or that's sitting around the table in that moment which again why are there a bunch of people with you on your second honeymoon? Yeah, but that's, a good point. that's yeah. yeah, that's Charles. But they, uh, the fact that she stands up to him, she's like, no, people want to go shopping. And then the kid, I love that the kids sort of step up and are and are on her side yeah. there too. It was just sort of a cute scene, and I think it really established Diana for us in this season of like, okay, this is going to be a more, I think, serious, more driven mm. version of Diana than we sort of got in the previous seasons where she was just sort of lost and so vulnerable and so sad. Yeah. But the fact that we learn all of these, this information about, about her in these interviews that she does or these tapes that she records where she talks about yeah. suicide attempts and how she threw herself down the stairs when she was pregnant with William. I mean, that's like, that's, that was so awful to hear. And the fact that she had to basically in secret, record all of these things and be the, have like an in-between person to give the tapes to the reporter just so yeah. that she could get her story out there just so people could understand what it really has been like living with this family living within this system when it was supposed to be this like fairy tale ending i mean the fact that she had to go through so many things just to sort of get her story out there i thought was like was really remarkable and really sad yeah. um and we haven't even gotten to the part where she actually in the season where we're watching where she's done the parade interview where no, we're still building up to yeah. that at this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I really enjoy this interpretation of Diana this season. I, I, the revenge dress is something we can talk about. I'm not <laughs> sure. Like it's interesting that the costume department did some of the things that they did and chose not to. It's, it was an interesting take on the, on the dress, but overall I really like Debecky's portrayal I'm really excited to see more because we've really seen in the storyline up to this point, the it's, you know, it's so supposed to be all about Queen Elizabeth, but we've seen her sort of step back from the yeah. central storyline yeah, so far. And we've got Charles and Diana really stepping into the foreground and it's so much more about them now. And I imagine yeah. that's only going to become more the case, the farther we get into, into season five here, but yeah. overall really liking what she's doing so far with the character how about you yeah another element of this that i think is fascinating is the sh i've seen some criticisms that the show doesn't isn't um diving deeper into the charles and diana the minutiae of everything that was going on but i also think we could get lost if we start to do that and like you said elizabeth would regress even further into the background if we start to dive yes. too deep into the charles and diana stuff but <clears throat> i would have liked to have seen more of the reaction to the book coming out because apparently the book comes out and there is no kind of Elizabeth calling her to task. There's Philip calling her to task before the book comes out, but there is no reaction to the book. There is Charles saying, oh, they're calling me Prince Harming. So that sucks for me. I'm going to deal with that too, along with those tapes coming out. So 
there's more of that in terms there's there's less of that rather than I wanted to see. I was hoping to see a bit more of that. Maybe, as you said, we've got five more episodes to go. Maybe that'll come as we go along. Uh, but I also think the way they're showing Diana, and you can take this two ways, which I think is really smart of the the writers and Peter Morgan here, is that you can take two ways the fact that um, you know uh, Andrew Morton wants to have wants to talk to her friends to verify some of the stories that Diana is telling him. And all the friends are like her acupuncturist or massage therapist. You know, her friend jokes that it could be her Rico or Rico therapy person or whatever it is, or whatever that's called Riki, whatever. Oh, yeah. Riki. That's what it is. Riki therapy person. So we're seeing that she's talking to everybody about her relationship. And we see her talking to Mohammed Fayed, talking to Peter, talking to everybody that she comes in contact with gets the doctor who is waiting for her. Like he, she talks to everybody about this relationship. So you can look at it in one way, which is if you're a Diana fan, which is they, she was so desperate to get out of the situation and to find some connection with people that she needed to kind of relieve herself or vent about this stuff so that she could function. Or you can look at it in a more cynical way that she wanted to talk to all these people so that, uh, you know, she could change the narrative around her and everyone would feel, um, and feel she was a victim and feel sympathy for her. And she could, maintain this uh, narrative about her as this um, caged bird in this situation. So I like that the, the they went that route and you can make your decision about how you feel about it. And I thought that was a really nice open way to interpret Diana and address both the support and the criticism that she has um, gotten over the years. Cause a lot, there are people in Britain who don't like her and feel that she manipulated this whole thing through her PR uh, people to churn Charles into the villain uh, when she was the one that was wanting attention and wanting to go in the press and want to do all these kind of things. And so we see that. But on the other side, there are a lot of people that support her who, who believe she was trapped in this situation and had no other way out. And I, I think I made in my notes, I think I wrote my notes in the fourth or fifth episode, you got to admire her guts to yeah. take on this entire family. It's not an, as Charles is, you know, finding his strength and belief in himself, Diana is as well by taking on this family and risking, you know, like we saw the guy, uh, Andrew Morton's house getting broken into, her friend getting run off the road by a van, risking possible, um, you know, hurt. And there are people who believe that the royal family staged her death, that were had a hand in it. So that's an element that I think was the subtly running through the first five episodes here as they confront her. And I thought that was really nice of the show to do that. Um, all right, let's move on to... Um, the ending of, oh yeah yes uh, the ending of all the marriages yeah let's move on to this other storyline that's or these multiple storylines that are running through these first five episodes which is the end of all these relationships these marriages you know separately i've thought about them but it wasn't until the show and watching the first five episodes that i went oh wow yeah right like every single one of their marriages except for elizabeth's and phillips ended up in divorce of her of her children um, with terrible results, you know, in the end, but for them emotionally and then moving on to other people. So what do you think about how they presented it with Anne uh, having that confrontation with the mother in the lighthouse and having an interest in another person and Andrew coming to her to talk about Sarah, Charles and Diana having to sit down with her and even Margaret, as I mentioned earlier, confronting her about Peter Townsend and all the things she's had to do. So what do you think about how they laid all that out is these kind of subplots that are running through these first five episodes. I mean, I think they did it really well and they balanced, I think, a lot of these relationships and how much screen time they got really well, mm. sort of with the exception of Andrew. I mean, we I think they're definitely and probably on purpose yeah. shying away <laughs> from having him on screen too much. But I will say that the yeah. little bit that they had of him was really funny. The actor that yeah. they have playing Andrew is like very charming and he plays the character in a very sympathetic and funny way. So I imagine, yeah, you gotta you gotta walk that back a little bit to not make <laughs> probably make him too likable. So it's, they're using him sparingly, but uh, at yeah. least it, it brought some humor to this season that I think I really I really enjoyed. Um, but yeah, I mean, Elizabeth is having to contend with like 
all of this destruction around her. Yeah. I mean, we sort yeah. of see that symbolized with the with the real life fire that happened at, at Windsor Castle. But, right. you know, her and Philip are finally, it seems, in a good place. They yeah. had to endure so much, so much drama, and they did the work and made their marriage work. And in, in this phase in the story, they're kind of the only two that are standing on firm ground. <laughs> Um, so at least it's at least good to see that. But the other side of that is that, yes, we're seeing Charles and Diana's marriage fall apart even more so than it kind of always has been. Yeah. But the fact that we're not solely focused on that, I actually like that we're giving some screen time to Anne. Like we're, this actress yeah. that's playing Anne, I think, is doing this in she's doing it so well. And it's almost in a way that's very reminiscent. And I think of like Leslie Manville and that she yeah. is very commanding when she's on screen. Um, I didn't know that Anne had like a sort of weird obsession with lighthouses. I think that's interesting. That was just an interesting <laughs> trivia fact that they threw in to this season. But mm. this sort of parallels that we get between her and Margaret, it just made the character so much more compelling, I think, this season. And I like that we got even more. I like that we sort of had like a Margaret centric episode. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love Timothy Dalton. So oh. I love that they brought him in to play this character, even if it's just for one episode in this, in this first five, this first half of the season. Um, I mean, he, that I, I, Timothy Dalton's like, I think almost 80 years old. He's very selective about what he says yes to these days. And I'm yeah. really glad that he said yes to this, even if it was like a small role. Um, Cause getting to see some of those sort of shades of the younger Margaret, that life of the party, vibrant mm. Margaret, Getting to see Leslie Manville play that version of Margaret as well as sort of playing the like older, wiser kind of toned down version of it was it was just a very yeah. dynamic performance and very complex. And I really enjoyed getting to watch it um, and get to getting to know more about this like sort of love story between her and Peter Townsend and then how that in turn affected her relationship with Elizabeth. And we see her sort of, you know, go to bat for her relationship and go to bat mm -hmm. for Anne just being like, you know, you you shut down this relationship between me and Peter that really could have been something. I'm not going to let you do that again. And I love that she stood up for there in this way, even though if it led to this big fight, it did lead to this really beautiful reconciliation between yeah. the two of them at the very end. I mean, I love that moment at the end where they're like on the phone and she's like, I love you and I love you too. And then they're just like, that was very middle class of us. Let's not do that again. I'm like, oh my God, we don't say I love you because it's middle class. Okay. But it's, it was just yeah. funny. And it, it, I thought overall, it was just a very well balanced uh, way that they showed all of these relationships just crumbling apart a, around Elizabeth as hers is finally just getting into a good place. Yeah. That's a great point you bring up that their relationship, uh, Elizabeth and Phillips is the one that's really kind of steadying the ship for lack of a better term throughout this entire first five episodes. And we're seeing everyone else kind of like being these rocks that slam against the ship and shatter because the ship must stay afloat at all cost, at all expense. And we're seeing what this uh, leads to here. And look, there are plenty of celebrities who have terrible relationships with their children or their children have said how neglected they felt growing up because the time they spent and athletes, famous people, the time they spent building what they what they built was time away from home when I spent with that they could have spent with the children, time away from home that they could have been there creating these relationships and deepening these relationships with their children. So imagine being the queen of an entire country and what the, what that demands of you. It, it is even more difficult and, and then having it be so expansive and having it be a privileged life where they feel that they can do whatever they want to do all of that comes into comes into play here and you're right and with the lighthouse makes so much sense her obsession with the lighthouse symbolically it makes so much sense with Anne. she has been this kind of thing that is there the uh the what, what is it the port in the storm the eye in the storm the light there that guides you home she has been that and she is that for charles she's the one that goes see charles to see charles after all after every scandal throughout the first five episodes She's the one that checks in with him. She's the one that talks to him. And so she has that responsibility and she loves him. And even in season four with that actress who played and she was great, she is defending Charles against Diana, even though Charles is cheating on Diana with Camilla Parker Bowles. She loves her family more than anything else and will defend them. And we see that come through here in the first five episodes of relationships here and her wanting to defy these expectations or kissing uh, her guy, I think Mark is his name, in front of the two people who are working on the in the uh, in the uh, garden. There, uh, she's defiant in that way. And Charles, in his way, of course, with Diana, we've 
talked already about that. But then Andrew, you're right. That scene with Andrew is so funny. <laughs> and he is okay with the fact that Sarah has been taking lovers new in, in numerous, numerous lovers throughout the years. And he's just like, ah, I wasn't around. I was doing these things or whatever. And it's so fascinating, you know, because this is something that has been unspoken between Philip and Elizabeth, his flirtation instincts, his possible cheating on her when they were first getting together and, or first married or whatever. So there've been a lot of questions about that. And even Margaret confronts her with that when in that scene between them before they have the reconciliation, when they're having the fight, she says, do you even ask him? Have you ever asked him, right? And she doesn't address it. Elizabeth does not address it. And so it's it's so interesting how these story, how these relationships as they shatter are exposing this, um, what the cost was of her becoming the queen and what it cost the children as well. And one, and it was, it must've been great for you to see young Tay Colma coming back here, Ben Miles as Peter Townsend. He's the young Peter Townsend there with Vanessa Kirby in that scene in the office when they're making out. So Tay Colma ah. doing, that is Tay Colma, Ben Miles doing his thing there and there. So, um, and overall, I just think it, it was really well done how they uh, addressed all of these storylines here in relation to the monarchy. Um, let's talk about the third episode, Mumu, specifically, because this is obviously a, a, an episode that they wanted to lay the very specific and extensive background for Mohammed Fayed and how he came into the royal family's orbit, which, of course, will be the link between Do between Dodi and Diana is Mohammed and Mohammed we see him as a young man we see him there in Egypt and he is aspiring or has feelings for this young woman who is the sister of this guy and they're both kind of from the richer side of the tracks but he has this asp aspiration this desire even against his father's wishes who says he hates the Brits um, because of what they've done to Egypt and what they've done in other countries which is a legit legitimate feeling for a lot of people Especially after Elizabeth died, you saw people of color come out from those countries and speak about the terrible things the monarchy did, monarchy did under Elizabeth's rule here. And those are valid complaints for sure. But we see uh, Mohammed say, my father has got small ambition. He's lost in that. I want to do more. And we see him grow and, and we cut to him as an older man. And he is buying the Ritz and the back and forth with the woman with Dodi there now as an older man because we see him being born because he did marry that sister of the guy. And so... We see him being part of this uh, relationship, but we see him initially become a little bit racist towards the, the Mr. Sidney Johnson. But then when he finds out who Sidney Johnson was, and Dodie is the one that tells him who Sidney Johnson was, Dodie is the one who had to do the uncomfortable task of letting him go, but also being you know, against his father in that decision, Dodie is the one that kind of softens him. And then when he finds out this whole comparison, as we bring back the actor who played Edward, and uh, we bring out the actress who played Wallace Simpson and we see them teaching Sidney or Mr. Johnson what he had to learn about becoming Brit British. And he's teaching Muhammad about this because Muhammad is still obsessed with becoming a British gentleman, an outsider wanting to become an insider. And we see Dodie's dreams, you know, him fighting for his dreams to be a producer, Chariots of Fire stuff comes up. But then it all leads to Muhammad wanting to sit next to the queen uh, at the polo grounds, and he buys Herod's for 600 million pounds to try to make that happen. And then eventually it's Diana who sits next to him and has a wonderful scene between those two actors there. So how did you think about, what did you think about this entire, I didn't want to sing about this episode because I think it was a kind of a different episode from the first five. And it was my favorite one of the first five. What did you think about how they laid the groundwork for all of this uh, stuff with Muhammad Fayed and then Dodi Fayed as well? This is definitely a departure from the other four episodes of the mm. first half of this season. I'm in the same boat, actually. Episode three was my favorite so far. Mm. Um, you know, it's this very, just this episode is sort of its own standalone thing. It's a very super condensed version of a story that takes yes. place over a lifetime. Yeah. And it's told in a very effective 50-minute episode of the show. And I really love this, like, sort of break that we take from the central storyline and we spend it with Muhammad Al-Fayed for the most part and, yeah. you know, go down this path and this journey that is centered around his relationship with Sidney Johnson and this complicated character who has experienced so much discrimination himself, yeah, Muhammad yeah, has, yeah. being racist towards this black man right. only to end up hiring him into his service with, I, you know, the intention of basically using him to get to what he wants 
But then he's sort of like, you see this relationship between these two men grow and they sort of, he learns to very much like love him as a dear, as a dear friend and care for him as he convalesces in his home at the end of his life. I mean, it was so moving. This story, just this episode alone, I thought was so great. It took less than an hour for me to get (laughs) fully invested and so attached to this story in particular. And that scene of like Sydney taking his last breath just left me in tears. And you know, that whole this whole section of the story of the Royals could be completely fictionalized. I don't know. I don't know what the real life relationship was between these two men, but it really made for beautiful storytelling in this episode, in this third episode in particular. And you're right. I mean, he took extreme measures buying Herod's of all things just to get close to the queen, just to get into their orbit only for like this, you know, this stupid concept that's so simple of racism yeah, preventing him from get from crossing the finish line in that in that aspect. Um, but I really love what we got out of it because the fact that we get this scene with Diana and him at the very end of episode three, mm. where she learns his nickname Mumu, which I think <laughs> I don't think was actually brought up at any point in the episode until the very end, except for the title. But I love yeah. that she is one of the first people that we that gets to hear that that's sort of an outsider of their family, and that she's kind of works her way into the inside of of sort of his family system and his world just by being herself and being charming and being sort of forced to step in and do her duty as a royal and not really wanting to do that but <laughs> you know having this great thing come out of it I think so yeah. it, it was a really well done episode I really liked it it's probably one of those that I think is going to be more rewatchable just because it's a it's it stands alone on its own yeah. um without having to commit to rewatching the whole season again but Overall, I really liked it. I love that it's your favorite episode too. What were your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's like the Aberfan episode. Every season has that one episode. And this was, yeah. I can immediately tell that this is going to be my favorite episode of the season. Certainly I can say right now, it is my certain, my favorite episode of the first five episodes. You know, as someone who is the son of immigrants, as someone who's in, you know, occasionally endured racism, who's seen his parents endure racism in this country, uh, I understand that in my own aspirations to want to do more to want to stand on my own two feet to want to create my own name to want to do something that makes me stand out i understand that about muhammad al-fayed you know i connect to that with his instincts and then i connected with his son saying to him like you know you gotta let me stand on my own two feet you gotta let me build my own legacy and there's such power in that and i love that we're seeing him go through the stages right like his his aspirations was as a young kid. Now he's confronted by his son having the same aspirations. So he as a father has to take a step back and understand that, have the perspective, him being racist, right? But then having to have that racism kind of thrown back in his face and how he deals with that. He develops a beautiful relationship with this man of friendship. So much so, as you said, he's feeding him the pills to help the to help him feel better, to help Mr. Johnson survive as long as he can. So there's a beautiful, I mean, him bringing him the tea is so symbolic. Right when he's having the cough and he's looking through the old pictures of uh, Edward and uh, and Wallace, uh, it is him who comes that, and then it's him who rejuvenates the castle. It's him yeah. who goes and buys that Edward's castle that he was at and re- and totally um, redoes it and brings it back to um, I don't know to pass code or whatever you want to say for Britain um, as a again a symbol of love that he has for the royals. He's doing all he can to show the royals that he loves them. Yet they just dismiss him as this person who is of, of brown color and not worth their time. And it is so frustrating. And I think Edward's relationship with um, Sidney Johnson is a nice way to kind of redeem Edward a little bit from some of the stuff we saw way back in season one and season two. Um, because um, it is well known that Elizabeth and her mother both hated Edward forever for the rest of for their lives until they both their passings because they blame edward for um their father for their husband and their father's death for uh, george's death because he took the kingship he wasn't he wasn't supposed to be king it was supposed to be edward and the kingship eventually consumed him and killed him and so they always blamed him as i've read that in numerous books about the royals so having a little bit of redemption for edward and how he maintained this relationship with mr johnson Sidney johnson and having that connect up to Muhammad Al-Fayed was so great to see. And I want to give love to Salim Daw, who plays Muhammad Al-Fayed, who was fantastic. Khalid Abdallah, who plays Dodi, he does a fantastic job with that as well. Um, and it was great to see the actors come back uh, who played um, Edward and played Wallace. Uh, I can't, I don't see the Edward 
actor. I always forget him because he played Charles in The Queen as well. So Peter Morgan bringing back that actor to play a different character in the Royals. I think all of it just really worked. And then at the end, just having them have the back and forth. And the tragedy here, Laura, they're laying the groundwork for the tragedy. His desire to be connected to the Royals it is what leads to Diana and Dodie bringing, uh, starting their relationship, which leads to their death. And it's the tragedy of this. And so I'm waiting for this Al Pacino and Godfather Part 3 moment when he hears about the death of his son and Diana in the car accident and his reaction to it. Because I imagine it's going to be earth shattering for us emotionally as viewers to see his reaction to it much more than Charles or Elizabeth or anybody else, but to see his reaction to losing his son. And it's because of his desire since he was a younger man to want to be an insider when he's an outsider. And in essence, almost validates his father saying, you should stay away from the Royals. Don't aspire to be English. So I'm, I'm seeing them laying the groundwork for this of when that's going to happen later on in the season. And I'm, I'm dreading what I'm going to be like when I react to it, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah that's going to be hard. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, let's hit John Major here. John Lee Miller, as we mentioned, Sick Boy from Train Spotting, and of course, Elementary and numerous other uh, films that he's uh, done and TV shows that he's done, playing uh, the Prime Minister. We don't get a lot of John Major, Laura, in this first five episodes, and Prime Ministers have been such a huge part of the previous four seasons. Kind of shocking to only see him in spurts, certainly at the beginning of the season, we see him there having the conversations with Charles and then having the conversation with Elizabeth right afterwards about the poll. And then at that party being confronted by Charles, Philip, Elizabeth, and Margaret uh, and Diana in, in different stages. And he later in the, in, the, um, in the episode, he's upstairs with his wife and says, my God, running the country and worrying about all those things. I didn't know I also would have to worry about this. And essentially him playing a referee in a soap opera as he's also trying to run the country and deal with all the stuff that's happening there, he has the conversation or has the conversation with Elizabeth about the uh, yacht or about the ship and what it needs. And like you said earlier, Elizabeth wanting the money from the people rather than them funding themselves. So what do you think about how they used John Major here throughout the first five episodes? Do you feel the same way that we needed more or do you think we'll get more of him in the back half of the season? I have a feeling we're going to get more of him in the back half, but I mm. wish we would have seen more. I mean, I was so surprised. I even had it in my notes ahead of time that it's yeah. Johnny Lee Miller playing John Major. And when I sat and watched the episode, I was like, who is that? Like, I mean, he's <laughs> unrecognizable yeah, agreed, as John yes. Major. It's really, really well done. I mean, you have, you got to put your hands together for the hair and makeup of every episode of every season of this show yeah um but i i le he legitimately disappeared for me behind all of that i didn't even see it so yeah i i was very surprised um i really like the character i really like what he was sort of serving up especially in this first episode where he was observing basically all the young royals like acting yeah. like drunken assholes being like i cannot believe that this is what i am gonna have to deal with but he he's again he's another one of those people that makes the point of like Charles is, you know, this really smart, educated guy who fails to understand that the greatest asset that he's bringing to the, yeah. the royal family is his wife. And he, so he just has all these great insights. And I really hope that we get more of him on screen because I just like what the character is bringing to the show so far. Um, and yeah, used, I think, crimin un criminally underused in the first five episodes of, the sh of this season so far is yeah, really yeah. kind of so all I have. And some of you may be watching our spoiler review going, oh, just you wait, just you wait. But, but both Laura and I have not gone past the first five episodes. So hopefully you are saying that because we, I agree with Laura. He is criminally, he's been criminally underused so far. And I want to see more because one of the aspects of The Crown that I really love, yes, I enjoy the soap opera stuff, but I really love the political stuff. And so when we got all of that with Margaret Thatcher, with the uh, fantastic work there, Gillian Anderson as Margaret Thatcher in the last season, that really excited me. So I want to see more of that as we go forward. And yes, we do have some of the, you know, arguments about wanting to modernize the monarchy and we have those meetings and there's elements of politics in that as well. How are we going to change things? How are we going to do things? Um, but it's, it's not enough. I want to hear about the economic policies. I want to hear about how that's affecting the country. I want to hear about how all these things are happening, what factories are being shut down, what, what new businesses are being brought in, those kinds of things I want to see as an element of what's also going to, uh, what's also going on with the Royal family. So we have a good balance Throughout. So hopefully in the back half of the season, we'll get that. Um, we should discuss Philip's relationship with Penny Natchbull, uh, Natchbull rather here, and his um, how that gets presented to us, which is uh, <clears throat> Penny Natchbull's young daughter um, 
has cancer at a young age and then uh, dies through the course of the, I think the first two or three episodes she dies and Philip goes over to Penny's house a day early or gets, there's something with a scheduling issue that's not, so she's there a day earlier than they thought. He ends up having a conversation with her, talks about the carriage riding and she brings, she shows him a carriage and he takes the carriage and he totally redoes it. And he is in essence, foists the carriage riding thing on her. By the way, this is the first I ever heard of carriage riding as a competition. Same. Never, never heard of it. <laughs> but like, uh, but she fo he foists it upon her and she takes to it. And Natasha McElhone, I've always loved her as an actress from like Truman Show on. Um, and so having her be a part of this, as I think is a nice little element here as well. What did you think about all of this? This is a lifelong friendship that is being laid the groundwork for here in the first five episodes. And there, there were a lot of, illusions that it could have been romantic even though both of them denied it a lot of people denied it her and elizabeth became friends so what do you think the point of this was because we see that eagle flying over or that bird flying over um three or four times during that episode what do you think this all means uh in the overall construct here of the season uh the bird flying over literally flew over my head i didn't catch that <laughs> <laughs> he kept so. looking up at I look forward to hearing what your actual, what your thoughts and interpretations of that are. But um, really, you're, I mean, I'm in the same boat where I did not know that carriage driving was a sport. I'm yeah. actually really curious as to whether or not it's still a sport or was this like an antiquated thing? I bet it's still a thing. Well, it's the 90s. Um, I imagine it still continued. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So that was, um, that it was an interesting insight because I didn't know it was a thing. I didn't know that Philip was into it, but apparently he's just been traveling up and down the country doing carriage riding as uh the sport so yeah. that was it was certainly educational i think um there's a lot of great there's some a few great scenes with philip and elizabeth again in this in this oh, yeah. episode in particular episode two is very philip centric i think and you know he tells her that she makes him a better person and yeah. she says that that's what a marriage is but then we sort of see him spending all of this time um with natasha and i really liked this this relationship because it wasn't until the very very end of the episode that i was sort of questioning i'm like this isn't like a romantic thing right and then realized i guess that has been like a rumored thing yeah in real life for a really long time and i i was not privy to that information until a couple of hours ago but mm. i um i really enjoyed getting to watch it's very it feels very paternal i mean it feels very much yeah. like a like a, a platonic friendship that has this sort of paternal edge to it. And it's just a really, I think a really sort of touching bunch of scenes. There's a lot of great conversations about grief and what it is and how he deals with it. And he talks about how he sort of has gone through the grieving process with his sister, right. which we saw yeah. some of those, we witnessed some of those scenes early on when Matt Smith was still playing the character right. and how devastating it was. Um, for him to learn about the plane crash and then actually see it. And then he has nightmares about it. Um, and he even says in this episode, you know, that that grief, you don't ever get over it. It stays with you. Um, and it, it you just kind of learn to live with it, I think. And it's it's just a really, I think it's a really well-written episode. It's a really well-acted episode, but you've got Jonathan Price. So like, what did you expect? Yeah. I just really love the relationship between these two characters. And I love that it's very much separate from his relationship with Elizabeth. Elizabeth yeah. is into horses as she is, doesn't really seem to have any interest in this carriage driving thing. It's yeah. very much Philip's own thing separate from her. Um, so it was great to sort of get to a, a Philip centric episode in this season where we got to get a little bit more insight into what he was doing in his later years when he wasn't playing polo because he'd had too many injuries and he's getting older. And I just enjoyed spending this more intimate time with him in this episode in particular. Yeah. It's, it's been fascinating to watch Jonathan Price's portrayal of Philip as we talked all the way near the beginning of this review. Um, you know, the him hearing his ears have been a big deal throughout the first five episodes, him hearing certain things, him, getting in touch with certain things, him connecting to certain, him coming after his son, him, that conversation with Diana, where he says, at times I've been on your side against my son, because I know how much of an idiot he is. There's, <laughs> there's a real kind of step back and look at all this panorama of stuff. He has a bit of a big picture feel to it at times, but this relationship, we know this from him from the season one. And I think that's one of the gifts of this season is that if you've been an avid watcher of the crown, there are little things that they refer. I mean, bring Peter Townsend back is the most uh, obvious one, but there are little things that they make a connection to or, or instances or 
um, uh, overall personality traits that they bring back from like the season, first season that they bring back here in the fifth season and have it bear fruit in certain, in different ways or in certain ways that are, that are different than we've seen before. And certainly this, his instinct, look, it's no, how can I say, it's no secret that he loved women and he enjoyed being flirtatious with women. There are, as I said earlier, there are rumors that he cheated on Elizabeth at times and would have his own thing. And we have the back and forth with him about secrets, right? About this idea of secrets. Um, and she's like, I don't think secrets do help a marriage. And he's like, well, that's a way of kind of having your own thing. And so this, in a way, this carriage writing stuff or carriage driving stuff with, um, with uh, Penny is his way of, uh, you know, uh, indulging that part of him that wants to be connected to a younger woman, you know, to still feel like he could possibly have some connection with a younger woman, but also wanting to share something he loves with somebody. Because as you said, Elis it seems like Elizabeth doesn't enjoy this. So him wanting to share this with another woman, because that's how, how he's kind of seen things, I think is, in, is a, a nice, interesting level to throw into Philip. And you can take it either way. You can not like it or like it, which I think is, again, a good thing that they do in the crown here. You can take it either, but she certainly takes to it. I thought initially he was like forcing her, which would have felt yeah. real creepy, but yeah. it feels like she does eventually kind of break free from the grief in here and starts to enjoy it herself. So we'll see how that plays out here. Cause as I said, if you study the history, they remain friends up, friends up until Philip death. In fact, she was the only non-family member to attend his funeral. The only non-family member to attend the personal private funeral of Prince Philip. So this is going to bear fruit as we go forward. Um, one thing I didn't bring up, and real quick before we wrap up the interview, I want to get your thoughts on this. Charles setting up that shadow monarchy or shadow government. What did you think about that, Laura? I mean, that seemed to be something we were building through through the entire four, first four episodes. And then the fifth episode really comes to bear as we see all these younger people around Charles. As we see him overcome these scandals, he is essentially creating a mini monarchy to maybe try to do a hostile takeover of the monarchy? I don't know. What did you think about that? Yeah, it, it certainly does come off that way that that might be the the end game. But mm. at the same time, you know, he has that conversation with Anne and she's like, you know, this isn't the 18th century anymore. You can't just have your yeah. own <laughs> private court. Um, and, and one of the things I haven't mentioned yet was I really oh. like the relationship between Anne and Charles. They really kind of close ranks. Yeah. In these first five episodes of the season, Andrew's not involved at all, which I'm sure is on purpose um, creatively. But this is <laughs> and the legally, relationship. probably. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. The relationship between Anne and Charles is really great. But this him sort of creating this this new court, I sort of interpreted this as like this is sort of a, a rebirth of Charles. I mean, we have we've yeah. gone through all this scandal with him. We see him sort of endure it. Um, in all facets, he has to sit and have this conversation with the with the court and with Philip lecturing him. And we see him just kind of looking down sort of shameful. Yeah. We see him kind of defending it when he's talking to Anne. And he's he's now coming out on the other side of it. And I just feel like this is him sort of stepping up and being like, you know what? They're not going to let me modernize the things that I want to modernize. They're wanting to take these little baby steps and do these very in make these very insignificant moves to sort of change things. And I want to make more significant steps in yeah. sort of improving the quality of the monarchy and how people interpret it and modernizing it just in general. So I I kind of liked this for this for the character. I liked mm -hmm. getting to see him sort of step up and come out on top after all of the controversy that's that's, you know, sort of followed him through the first five episodes of this season. Um I'm not totally sure where it's going since we haven't seen <laughs> six through 10. Um, I imagine a hostile takeover doesn't actually happen since I didn't hear no, about right. that in history. So maybe yeah. they're taking some real creative, uh, you know, freedoms with the season. I don't know. Maybe that's where we'll go and not TBD, but overall yeah. I really liked what that uh, is sort of concerning as it is for the Royal family. I kind of like that they brought that into this story for, for Charles. Yeah, we should give some love to Claudia Harrison, who plays uh, Princess Anne. She's doing a fantastic job. I'm not too familiar with her work. I think I've seen her in a couple of British TV episodes, but not overall familiar with her work. But seeing her here, I love her. I think you're absolutely right. I love her relationship with Charles. And, and yeah, they keep Andrew out for their own reasons. But yeah. this, I think for all the negativity around the marriages, the one thing that you can take out of this... Um, how can I say this? This family situation with Elizabeth. Yes, her kids all go through divorces. And we hear the when she's having the conversation with, I think it's a bishop there, 
uh, from the church, you know, him saying himself, oh, my, my daughter is going through divorce. My son has moved out of the house and is separated from his wife. So this is a common, this is, you know, common to start divorce started to become a real big deal in the eighties and nineties uh, and where the numbers started rising um, and, and what have you. But the connection between our children is strong and not a lot of, no, I can say this. Not, I would argue that probably not a lot of families have connections as strong as these children have with each other. Charles and certainly seeing it through Charles and Anne. And if I think they could have thrown Andrew in there, we'd have seen more uh, of that because even now Charles is still somewhat protecting Andrew, even though he stripped him of some of his titles and continued that from what happened with the Epstein situation, there's still a genuine care for his brother. So if nothing else, uh, uh, she has created a family that cares about each other. And as you said, closes ranks around each other to protect each other. And there is something good to be said about that because having family to, to rely on is something that some people don't have in this world. And it's great to see that here as an element of the crown and an element of this family and their relationships uh, in the series for sure. Um, all right. Any final words, anything we've missed anybody we haven't take, taken time to have a conversation about here in the first five episodes that you, you want to bring up here, Laura? I think we've covered most of it for me mm. so far. I mean, this was this first half of the season, I think, was really, really solid. I was pleasantly yeah. surprised how happy I was to be back in this world and back with these characters and back with a new cast who are just knocking it out of the park left and right. Um, I, sh I had no doubt that the storytelling would be phenomenal and it still is just blowing it out of the water at every angle. So I'm really enjoying it. I'm assuming that the, la the second half of the season is going to end strong. Um, and would be interested to see more with Andrew and with Sarah Ferguson. I'm yeah. kind of, like, I'm assuming maybe we've seen the last of it, unfortunately, but it would be <laughs> nice to get a little bit more information. I wish we could get more Timothy Dalton as Peter Townsend, but I doubt we're getting more of that too. Um, but for the most part, overall, looking forward to getting back into the episode six through 10 and seeing where it goes. Yeah, me too. I mean, every time I walk into a crown season, I'm like, eh. Yeah, and then you start, and you're like, "Oh wow, this is so good!" You just love it, um, and it it just it's for me. It just moves me in an organic way, in a visceral way when I'm watching these characters. Because as I've said, I'm a massive um, fan of the monarchy in terms of its existence. Maybe not always supporting its decisions, but certainly its existence. And so I get that fascination indulged uh, when I watch this show, and I love the way they take their time with these characters. So I've seen some people criticize that they're letting him off the hook, maybe a little bit, but we've only seen the yeah. first five episodes. So I don't know what's going to happen over the next five and how those things are coming to play. But I think this is taking a much more understanding, not necessarily forgiving, not necessarily excusing, understanding approach to the Royal family, which I like. We're getting much more complex characters. We're as a viewer, we're being challenged a bit more to understand them and maybe take a look at our own inconsistencies or hypocrisies or where we've said this is the way it should be but we kind of change the rules when it applies to us or applies to someone we love or a family member so all of those things are coming through here but aside from that the performances the writing the direction of all of these episodes and and what i should give some love to is jessica hobbs who directs the first two episodes uh, alex gabasi is the one who does mumu um, and oh, I can forget the uh, and then uh, I forget the other two. Uh, let me have it here. My El Tuki does the last two episodes of of the first five episodes here. So fantastic direction all around from all the directors and all the writers here as well, and bringing us all uh, to bear. And the costume design stuff and the set designs. I mean, that shot of the ship. I think it was the first or second episode out on the water. That was. Gorgeous, not the yacht, the ship, Britannia. It was gorgeous, and I was like, "Yeah, this is the kind of stuff that you want to see." That they sink their budget into to getting you the feeling of what that was like or when what that time was like uh, back then um, uh, for overall. So yeah, I, I love the first five episodes. I've been enjoying the season. We'll see what the back app has for us. Yes, yeah, so do I wish there was more major? Wish there was a little bit more reaction. To Diana's book certainly. I hope there's more Diana because I do also think. We've only gotten Diana in certain doses. I hope Diana becomes a little more prevalent over the back half of the season and certainly leading sadly to her passing, uh, tragically. Um, we'll see how that all builds up as well. So yeah, looking forward to episodes six through 10, just like Laura is as well. All right, well, thanks all, everybody so much for watching this spoiler review episode, the first five episodes of The Crown, uh, season five. We've really enjoyed diving into everything. And if we've missed anything, 
please let us know down in the comments section below. Or if you want to uh, maybe educate us on some of the historical connections on some of the stuff they've shown here in the first five episodes that we as Americans aren't 100% uh, dialed into, please let us know in the comments section below. If we've missed anything, if you disagree with anything, keep it cordial, of course, and civil. But let us know down there in the comments section below. Hit a like on this video and share it on your social media with that hashtag, The Outlaw Nation, if you don't mind. Uh, Laura, uh, another fun time with you. We'll be back to do 6 through 10 sometime later on in the week. Um, we'll let the people know where they can find you and everything that's going on, please. Sure. Come find me on Twitter. I am at shut up underscore Laura for the time being. I mean, who knows what's happening with Twitter? It certainly was an interesting <laughs> so weekend oh, and yeah. we need to see uh, what went down, go down. But that's where I am for now. Yeah. Um, I'm also on the same handle at Instagram. That's at shut up underscore Laura. The show that I host with my friend Alice is called Force Toast to Star Wars Happy Hour, where we drink wine and talk about Star Wars. And I like to jump on here with John and the Geek Buddies every now and again to talk about other Star Wars shows. We're talking about Andor recently, yeah. hopefully getting into the Bad Batch and the Mandalorian when those come back soon and looking forward to that. Yeah, and we'll be bringing Jedi way back soon after the Andor stuff wraps up. So look for that as well down the road. Um, as for me, you go follow me at The Roca Says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, which is right there on your screen. The channel, please remember to subscribe to the channel. Maybe some of you discovering the channel for the first time. Appreciate you all subscribing. There's a lot of great stuff happening on the channel. We're building slowly but surely, but very proud of the shows that are on here. And of course, having great guests like Laura Kelly taking the time to come on and help the channel grow and give the channel a personality is always good for us. So please subscribe to the channel down below and hit that bell button as well. Um, yeah, and that's it. And hit a like and leave a comment. All right, I already said that. So we're out of here. Y'all take care of yourselves. Be well. And we'll talk to you next time with another brand new spoiler review episode, episode six through 10 here of The Crown on the Outlaw Nation. Take care. Music